to Lori Grace from Sunrise Center and Adam Scow from Food and Water Watch who are heroically fighting um, on, on the fracking issue. So we really need to know about this. Who knows about fracking in the Bay Area? Raise your hand if you already know about this issue. It's not very many of us, so I'm really glad you're here. Please spread the word. And Peter Asmus is going to interview them. Peter, come on to the stage. All right, while they're getting organized, I'm just going to mention a few actions. All right, two people took action with Sonoma Biochar. Eight people uh, pledged to be, do the plastic ban with Green Samba. And uh, 10 people have pledged to take care of themselves instead of spending money on products and things uh, with Breathing Retraining Center. There have been two vegan pledges uh, and 18 vegetarian uh, pledges. And one pledge on fracking. So we're going to come back with more reports on the actions, but I hope this motivates you to, after you hear this, to take action on fracking, to go outside and take more actions, and to be part of more actions that will happen in here. Thank you so much. We really appreciate your support. Is this working? Yes, it is working. Okay, well, uh, we were just talking about climate change. Now we're going to talk about natural gas fracking, which is related. Um, I don't think, you know, this fracking thing, I, I don't think I heard the word fracking. I don't remember the first time I heard it, but maybe about a year ago. It seems like it's this recent thing, although it's been going on for quite some time, but it's hit the media just recently. Um, and I think I'll just let you both introduce yourselves and then we can ask some questions. But when you introduce yourself, I'd like to know, how did you get involved with this issue? You know, is it something personal? How did you learn about it? How did you get involved with this issue? So, you want to start? Sure. Okay. Sure. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, Adam Scout here with Food and Water Watch, uh, working on uh, banning fracking here in California. Uh, for those who don't know, Food and Water Watch is a national public interest consumer group. Uh, working to protect our water and food supply. We do that in a numerous, numerous ways, fighting water privatization, working to protect family farmers, and uh, we've been taking on this fracking fight nationwide. We started uh, on the East Coast uh, fighting uh, to protect the Marcellus Shale, upstate New York, Pennsylvania, West Virginia. Some of those states have already been heavily fracked. And uh, for those who don't know, a quick definition of fracking, Fracking is a process to ease the extraction of oil or gas. You can frack for oil, you can frack for gas. Sometimes people just associate it with natural gas. And I say that because in California, much of the fracking will be for oil. Uh, the process itself involves the injection of millions of gallons of water, toxic chemicals, about 500 of them, uh, and sand, blasted deep underground to explode the shale, the rock, uh, in order to ease the extraction and freeze up, free up the oil or gas and they can pump it up. So it's a very intensive, sometimes it can be last a week, sometimes it can last a month, uh, very intensive, very polluting process that has now become uh, underway. And so Food and Water Watch is working uh, to, uh, with citizen groups across the state, across the country, right here with Marin, with Roy Grace, uh, to win a ban on fracking. And it's going to be a heck of a fight, akin to the Keystone XL fight, uh, that people are very concerned, and we all get involved. What was previously thought to be impossible will become possible. About six months ago, somebody said, oh, do you know that they're selling uh, leases uh, for uh, fracking in Sacramento? 
and I had only heard about it on the East Coast. And uh, I was shocked uh, because I was aware of the, um, the uh, uh, limitations we have on water in our state, the pollution of water, and also the possibility of earthquakes. And I had heard about the earthquakes in other states that had been fracked. And so um, I really became alarmed, and then I became even more alarmed when I talked to Adam Stout, uh, my friend from Food and Water Watch, and I learned that some, uh, some leases had been sold uh, as far upstream on the Sacramento River as Antioch and Sutter County, and uh, that the chemicals like benzene and toluene, toluene were coming down into our bay. And I've also been involved with ocean protection, and I'm aware that dolphins now frequently have cancerous tumors, uh, leopard sharks, and one of our native sharks in the bay are turning up dead in very large numbers. And so, uh, once again, I uh, turn to education, and I truly believe, uh, you know, uh, when Peter Joseph showed that film of Obama, if we as citizens in large numbers begin to really express ourselves, I think we have a chance. Otherwise, a hundred billion dollars, which is what's been allotted to begin to promote all of this, uh, will win. So I'm so happy all of you are here at this time to, uh, to learn more. Okay. So, um, being someone who's been writing about energy issues for 25 years, I can't believe it's that long already, but it is that long. Um, you know, for a long time, the environmental community and even renewable energy advocates would sort of say, you know, natural gas, it's the bridging fuel, was the term we often heard. It's the, it's sort of, you know, not as bad as coal or oil, and, you know, it also helps when the sun isn't shining or the wind's not blowing natural gas, it's often called flexible generation. Uh, unlike a coal plant where it's hard to turn it on right away, it's hard to turn a coal plant like on within five minutes and have it pick up. So there's been this whole argument that natural gas was sort of good for the environment. But I think now with the fracking thing, it's really that whole argument has come under scrutiny. And I just read an article, and maybe you might have paid attention to this, that actually the problem with natural gas is the emissions are methane, which is actually worse than carbon dioxide. Usually when we talk about climate change, we tend to talk about carbon dioxide or carbon. But methane, which is, I guess, in essence, natural gas, I think is 40 times or something worse than carbon dioxide. So maybe you could elaborate on that. So when we hear natural gas as this bridging fuel, not as bad as coal, but there's also an extreme downside to natural gas. And I've been hearing there's a lot of leakage which was not accounted for previously, so. Yeah, I'd like to answer that in two parts. One on uh, whether it's cleaner, and second on who is it actually for. Uh, on whether it's cleaner, uh, that has been the selling point from the natural gas companies, uh, because natural gas does burn a little bit cleaner than uh, oil and coal, uh, that it is a bridge fuel. However, what we're seeing throughout the entire life cycle process and practice of fracking, from the hundreds of diesel truck trips, to the uncontrollable release of methane through the fracking process, because when you're fracking, you're pretty much creating a pipe bomb explosion with fissures all around. Uh, they can horizontally drill once they're down a mile, uh, horizontally out a mile in any direction. And we're seeing uh, lots of methane escape, which as you correctly noted, is a much more uh, damaging greenhouse gas than CO2. So when you look at the entire life cycle of fracking, it's a comparable to coal. And this is what a, a scientist at Cornell University have been finding, Dr. Tony Grafea. Uh, there's increasing literature on this. And on the leaks, the spills, the accidents, those are the norm with fracking, not the exception. Uh, the second part of who is the uh, natural gas and the oil actually for, uh, you might have heard that the U.S. Uh, Energy Association Administration is now projecting the United States to become a net exporter of both gas and oil. The, on the Oregon coast, their plan is to build four export liquefied natural gas terminals to send that over to Asia. Uh, so what we're really uh, 
coming to uh, understanding the current situation with fracking is if we're going to be allowing continued con contamination of our water and our air so a couple of oil and gas companies can get wildly rich exporting the resource to China. Okay. Martin, did you have something to Yeah, I can also add. I, I want to, again, uh, support you taking an active role. I went to the White House with the American Sustainable Business Council and uh, the energy representative from Obama's cabinet was there and he talked about clean fracking. And, Is that like clean and, coal? And yep. he was challenged by some members of that council and he you know, defended it and said this is the administration's point of view. And, and then when he stepped off the podium, he said, I don't believe in this either. And, and I've been told to say this by the administration I work for, and please don't mention it, you know, the, my personal views, okay? So again, when Obama talks about the people that have to make a kind of pressure to make it so uh, absolutely imperative that the politician speaks on that behalf and it, it speaks even more. Also, I, I want to say again, following through what you were saying, as somebody who's been dealing with climate change issues, um, we are standing to have earthquake induced, uh, uh, earthquakes induced by fracking. Uh, the, where they have been fracking was within 25 miles of the Hayward Fault. We're in for another earthquake potentially with the Hayward Fault. We've got Livermore and Nuclear Lab and Chevron on the Hayward Fault. And this could be a profound disaster. Also, if you recall from Japan, earthquakes cause tsunamis. So if we get an earthquake, we stand with even more likelihood with ocean level rise to experience a devastating tsunami here in the Bay Area. So we do not want something that causes earthquakes operating in the Bay Area. I mean, I don't think we want it anywhere, but <laughs> especially, <laughs> especially the Bay Area, right near our nuclear labs and our facilities in Chevron, which takes no responsibility for the damages it causes. So, you know, again, I can't tell you how much of the future is in your hands. So, um, in terms of fracking, you know, I think if you read articles from the energy press, you know, they, of course, hail fracking because it's kept energy prices low and we've had a recession and so, you know, they've been sort of touting it. And, and, it's pretty much, a, uh, my understanding is more North America because, you know, in Europe, they still have carbon limits. So I don't think that, I mean, I don't know, is, is fracking, I guess that's a question, is fracking pretty much a, a U.S. or North America phenomenon or is it global? It's becoming increasingly global. Uh, okay. Many countries in Europe actually have bans on fracking. That's what I thought. Uh, several U.S. states, uh, the state of Vermont has banned fracking, New York and New Jersey currently have moratoriums. Uh, and there are efforts to begin fracking in China, Africa, North Africa. Shell just got a contract in Tunisia, and we are working in Europe to hold it off as well. So yes, it is mostly, uh, it's largely been done in states like Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Colorado, Wyoming, Montana. Uh, one of the big outcomes is of that 2005 energy bill, uh, which uh, Dick Cheney had a lot of influence over, uh, were two things. One, the Halliburton loophole, the exemption from the safe drinking water laws that everybody else has to comply with. The dirtiest, most nasty process, fracking, does not have to comply with. The second thing was a massive opening of the Bureau of Land Management lands out in the West. This land is your land, this land is my land. It's actually been mostly turned over to Halliburton's land. And uh, the documentary Gasland uh, documents that very powerfully when you see beautiful areas of the West have been turned into these moonscapes of, uh, of, of leftover uh, damage from fracking. Now, uh, one thing I remember, and there was a woman I was working with in Texas, I think her name was Texas Sharon, or she had a website, 
And we, we did an article together where it's actually easier to frack in a residential neighborhood than install solar in Texas. That's how ridiculous it was. You could actually get a permit to frack in a residential neighborhood, I believe, within weeks or something ridiculously short. Now, that's what I understand is there are even efforts by state governments to strip local government regulatory authority to govern fracking. I think it was a bill in Pennsylvania. I don't think it passed. But is that... Does that ring true? I mean, Absolutely. I mean, Colorado, uh, a town of the city of Longmont, um, has banned fracking within city limits, and now the oil and gas companies, with the support of the governor, who used to work for them, is suing the town. And we're actually hoping to get that law amended uh, to restore a community's right to ban fracking. Currently in California, communities do have that right to ban fracking. Uh, most of the uh, fracking regulation which there is none, by the way, as it's done by the state of California. It's called the Division, Division of Oil and Gas and Geothermal Resources, also known as Dogger. Dogger is a very industry friendly, uh, has been accelerating permits, celebrates oil development. It's actually in its charter to promote oil development above protecting the public health. And here in California, a company doesn't even have to get a permit to frack. Uh, the agency just says, oh yeah, you're drilling, fracking, whatever, tomato, tomato. And so companies have already been fracking uh, the Monterey Shale, this rock formation between San Francisco and Los Angeles, where it is estimated that there are up to 15 billion barrels of oil, uh, much, much of we, which will require fracking to extract. It's also right along our earthquake fault, San Andreas Fault. Lori mentioned that fracking does promote earthquakes. It's absolutely true. Uh, so uh, we are at the precipice of that battle here in California uh, to uh, protect our state from you know, what's ironic about this is uh, in my last book, which was like the history of uh, California's energy, I don't think a lot of us are aware that we were actually the wildest oil state in the whole country. California, we were like, crazy. In fact, there was the Teapot Dome scandal. There are all these scandals. And if you look at old pictures of Huntington Beach, there were oil there. It's lining up and down the beach. And so, it was the Santa Barbara oil spill of 1969, which really started the environmental movement and actually started the whole sort of reversal of uh, the oil industry. So of course, that frustrates companies like Chevron and other companies who've been here. And of course, we don't have a lot of offshore oil development, so this sort of fracking thing. And what I heard, I think you mentioned the Monterey Shale, that's the main area that they're interested in. And if you drive through there, you'll notice the oil there it is, there. So, in terms of what is the status in California, wasn't, is everything like on a whole pending some sort of review, or where are we exactly right now? Can people frack? Companies right continue to frack. The state is undergoing a regulatory process. There's a draft, uh, regulations. They're going to be very weak, and they're not going to be uh, adequate to protect the public health. And this is one thing that's clear about fracking. There's no safe fracking. When you're mixing when you're losing all that fresh water, mixing all those chemicals to blast deep underground to extract oil, even if there was a clean way to extract oil, one of the things we're learning about the climate crisis is that we're one small planet. So if we're going to build, burn 15 billion barrels of oil in California or China or wherever the heck we're going to burn them, it's going to have a very bad effect. There's no more away. There's no more high escaping from the problem. We're all in it together. And uh, you look at 15 billion barrels of oil and fracking for that, that is comparable climate impact to the Keystone XL pipeline. So this is part of the same monster, the tar sands, Arctic drilling, fracking, offshore oil drilling in the Gulf. It all needs to be stopped. We need to begin the transition to renewables now and not destroy our water resources yeah. for 20 years more worth yeah. of fossil fuels. And speaking of our oil resources, let's remember all the almond farmers that had to stop watering their trees last year. We're talking about thousands, hundreds of thousands of gallons of water being driven down to the earth of California water. <laughs> the Colorado River is down to its last legs. You know, uh, down in Southern Cal, they're thinking of creating that pipeline to channel the water down. This is not a state that can afford to experiment with its water. Okay, and on that, we are done. So, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. I'd just like to say one thing. I'd like to say if we have a booth right outside, if you want to be part of that uh, group.
group of committed citizens that creates change. Come sign in. We have classes and organizing groups that we're meeting at Sunrise Center with, together with Food and Water Watch. Um, and we have one on May 12th, and we're going to be doing many others. So come to our booth, sign up, and make a difference. Thank you. Thanks, Adam, Lori, and Peter. Wow, that's nice and loud. Um, 